Good evening. Um, tonight's talk is called Cancer Killers. You know, uh, this is a very personal issue, isn't it? Every one of us in this room has been affected by cancer. Um, and so I'm sensitive to that. I, I want you to be aware of that. But I think that it's important that we talk honestly and frankly about the situation um, because it's a life or death matter. Does that make sense? Um, so it may seem a little heavy at times tonight, but it's kind of a heavy subject. You know, I don't really think there's a way to make cancer fun to talk about necessarily. Um, and, and I understand it's a personal issue because it's personal to me, right? Uh, the second week of February of this year, uh, we finally did Christmas at my house with my wife's family. And uh, it was a really fun day. Everybody was together. My wife's family's kind of all over the place, and everybody got together. Um, by the end of February, my father-in-law was laying in a hospital um, with stage four kidney cancer um, all through his body. Uh, as I stand here today, he's lost about 100 pounds. I guess maybe thankfully for him, he had 100 pounds to spare. But. Uh, it's a big deal. Today, I just had a gentleman walk in and get adjusted a half an hour ago, and I uh, hadn't seen his wife this week and asked how she's doing. He says, oh, she's visiting family in Texas, her niece, she's 34, she just died of cancer, four kids, right? And you all have the same stories. Um, the problem is, it's not getting better, it's getting worse. You know, we've thrown more money at this thing than we've thrown at anything ever in the world literally, in healthcare. Nothing, no money's been thrown at anything more than has been thrown at this. The incidence is worse. It's, we are more likely to get it now than ever. Um, we keep people alive possibly a little longer, depends on how you read that research. Um, it's heavy, it, it's, a, it's a heavy subject. Um, but a few things. First of all, my goal is for you to leave here tonight feeling hopeful, right? Um, we, we are not victims to this condition. Um, there's a lot of people that would want you to feel like you're a victim to this condition because if you're a victim to this condition, there's nothing you can do and you need somebody to save the day, right? And that person to save the day in America is radiation, chemotherapy, drugs, and surgery. Increasing at a rate, depending on what you read, 14 to 15 percent annually, that's the rate of increase financially. They expect that industry to grow continually at a rate of about 15 percent a year, right? <laughs> so I guess if we were um, investing in something um, in some sort of a weird, sick way, it would be a good place to invest, wouldn't it? Um, you know, wh why, why would we create an industry that the design isn't to make things better? And uh, so, that's what we're here to talk about tonight. Um, and when we talk about this, there's a, there's a possibility that somehow some of us can feel partially kind of condemned about things as we go through this process and guilty of, of stuff. And, and that's not the point of it either, right? Um, a great quote that I think of all the time is that if you drive through life looking in the rear view mirror, you'll wreck, <laughs> right? <laughs> And so, so often we do that. We drive through life looking in the rearview mirror. I, I usually can tell I'm off track when I'm doing that, when I'm beating myself up about if I would have, if I could have, if I should have, if I, uh, you, know? you know, I'm about ready to wreck because I'm driving through life looking through the rearview mirror. We can't do that. We, we have right now, and planning is bringing the future into the present. Does that make sense? Planning is bringing the future into the present. What can I do in the present to affect the future? I can plan. I can make decisions. I can make choices. I can do things. Right? So some of what I tell you tonight, you're going to be like, yeah, I kind of always believed that and knew that. But some of it, um, the primary concept of tonight's talk, what is cancer, um, was revolutionary for me, and I think it will be for you. So let's talk about a little bit of statistics because I think it's important. 41.24% of all men and women at some point in their life in America are going to have cancer. That's a lot. So you can say one in two men and women are going to have cancer. Cancer is still the leading cause of death from disease among children, right? So of all children that die from disease, the leading disease that children die of is cancer. And that number is increasing rapidly. Just think about it in your own life. Have you heard of more and more and more children having cancer? 
right? Um, so did our genes change? <laughs> Some of you that have been with me for a long time and heard these talks, I, I've beat that concept into your mind. No, they haven't. And we're going to talk about some science of that. It takes thousands and thousands and thousands of years to change. So if a health epidemic pops up in a short period of time, like 100 years, and it's impossible for genes to change in that amount of time, it cannot be a genetic condition. It cannot be. <laughs> it's just not possible. Global cancer cases expected to rise 75% by 2030. If we continue to do exactly what we're doing, right? These are pictures. I said this is personal. These are pictures of a guy that I went to chiropractic school with. His name is Dr. Charles Majors. He's a chiropractor. Um, in Chicago land area and um, we lived in adjacent apartment buildings in chiropractic school and about four years ago I started getting emails pray for Chuck pray for Chuck pray for Chuck he's in bad shape so this is a normal MRI over here and uh, you can see this is the brain stem up through here and stuff this is Chuck's over here can you see that there's massive tumors growing in there you see those big lumps that's stage four cancer. Um, they were pressing on the brain stem, squishing his cerebellum into his skull. Cerebral spinal fluid couldn't flow around his brain, and um, he, was in, he was in bad shape. Um, when they finally got the MRI and got him into the hospital, they drilled a hole in the top of his head, and he said it was, he could feel the pressure come out of his head for the first time in literally a long time. And um, this whole concept, what we're going to talk about, this book, he, he wrote this book since then. Um, this is Chuck in the hospital. Um, he had lost about 40-some pounds at that point in time. When this started, he was bench pressing 400 pounds. Um, that's him there. He was leaving the hospital here. They went in to do surgery. It was, they thought it was benign, so they went in to do surgery. They opened him up. They went to move the tumor. When they went to touch it, it immediately just started to bleed everywhere. Um, they closed him up, came out, told his wife, um, Dr. Ben Lerner, uh, Dr. Mark Supernaut, his friends that were there with him, that um, if they did, he may not make it through the night. Um, the swelling was going to be massive because when they tried to move the tumor, it just started immediately bleeding everywhere. They closed him up. And... Um, that was that. Fortunately, he woke up the next day. Um, at that point in time, his options were chemo, radiation, and um, six months. And at that point, uh, based on his beliefs and what he believed to be true, he said, this can't be. Um, this isn't going to happen. And he checked himself out of there. Um, they allowed him to do it essentially because there, there was no prognosis, right? There wasn't, there wasn't a fight really because what was the point? Um, but he told them he was going to immediately get on a plane and fly to Rio, uh, to Nevada, to a special clinic there. And they said, we don't know if your head can take the pressure of doing that. Well, what did he have to lose, right? It was, it was all on the line. Um, the book is written. Um, I was with him in September at a seminar. It's three years later. Um, he is completely fine. He's 100% reversed the cancer. Um, he's alive, walking around. He's flying around the country with this book right now as we speak, adjusting patients, I'm sure today, in his clinic. Um, and uh, you would never know. You would never know. And the concept in this book is the cause is the cure. And we're going to talk about that tonight. The cause of cancer is the cure of cancer. If you address the cause, you fix the problem. If you don't address the cause, you never fix the problem. Um, so, you know, I have a copy of the book for all of you here tonight. You can take it with you and read it. It's, um, it's a very touching story, but it's real. It's not pretend. It did happen. When I was with him in September, we were in Green Bay, and two oncologists came to hear him speak because they essentially didn't believe it. And... Um, they said in their 17 years together, they have never seen a stage four um, 
cancer. His was coming from his blood. That's where his cancer was coming from, from his blood um, into his brain, make it in reverse. It, it, they'd never seen it happen. Um, so if it can happen for one person, it can happen for another person. And that's what my life is about, trying to end needless suffering, right? Um, there is suffering in this world, but there is needless, endless, copious amounts of needless suffering going on, and we can address that. Um, that guy sitting right there with the Kentucky shirt on was the center fielder on my college baseball team, and um, he just had a brain tumor taken out of his head. Um, so thanks for coming, Biddle. So it's a big deal, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a personal situation, but I'm here to tell you that I confidently stand in front of you and say that, that the cure for cancer is exists, it's already here, we know what it is, it's not a secret, you brought it in here with you tonight, it's just tapping into it and using it, right? So what is cancer? Every cell in your body has a life cycle, right? Um, it's programmed cell death. If you take a cell biology class, it's called programmed cell death. Every cell in your body is going to live and die. If you can, you know, a couple years from now, literally every cell that's in my body right now standing in front of you is dead and replaced by another cell. So my logical brain says, well, if that's the case, then why doesn't cancer take care of itself? Why aren't the cells just alive and they live their life cycle and they die? Because cancer cells never die. That's the difference. Regular cells die. Cancer cells never die. Okay, they're, they never die, got it? They're just growing in there. Uh, essentially all cancer is is abnormal cell growth. It's a group of cells that are growing abnormally. A normal healthy cell functions aerobically, meaning it needs oxygen. Does that make sense? A cancer cell doesn't need oxygen. It can live anaerobically and it feeds on sugar primarily. Cancer cells will literally create extra sugar receptors on the outside of the cell, on the cell wall, so that it can get more sugar, because it needs to eat, it needs to live, right? Your body's designed to kill cancer. Um, every one of us have cancer cells in our body right now. I essentially have cancer right now. Right? There's, but if my immune system is strong and in place, then it's going to take care of that. So here is the primary concept we're going to build from tonight. So unlike a movie where you've got to kind of wait to the end, we're, we're going to get it out there. Let's get to the point, right? So if we understand what a healthy cell needs to live and we understand how a cancer cell lives, we can really put this piece of the puzzle together, okay? Because all we are, if you've been to my wellness classes before, Health is literally cellular health. So if we can create healthy cells, we can create healthy you. All you are is a bag of cells, right? You're 75 trillion cells. That's what you are, all working together. And if those individual cells are healthy, then you're healthy, okay? So what does a healthy cell require? It requires oxygen. It needs lots of oxygen, right? It requires um, an alkaline environment, all right? Healthy cells live in an alkaline environment. It requires nerve supply. Right? It needs proper nerve supply to get to it. And, it. and it doesn't need sugar. A cancer cell, on the other hand, lives anaerobically. It can live in a low, low oxygen environment. Okay? It needs sugar. It thrives on sugar. And for the vast majority of them, it lives in an acidic environment. Okay, there's some very, very few cancers that live in a very, very alkaline environment, but still that's a pH problem where you're out of balance. But for all intents and purposes, what we're talking about is cancer cells need to be in an acidic environment. So they need lots of sugar, they need little oxygen, right, and they need an acidic environment. A healthy cell needs lots of oxygen, an alkaline environment, right, and proper nerve supply going to it. So let's think about this. Hang in there with me. This is a concept you've got to follow me through. If I'm a healthy cell and I'm living in a body that has a high sugar content, a high acidity content, and poor nerve supply, what's going to happen to me? I'm going to die. I'm going to die because I, I can't live in that environment. But the body has an innate intelligence, right? 
Every cell in your body has an innate intelligence. All the body's ever trying to do, all every cell in your body is ever trying to do every day, every second is what? Stay alive. To survive. That's all it wants to do. But this cell can't live in that environment. So what does that cell do? It morphs into a cancer cell that can live in an acidic, low oxygen, high sugar environment. You got it? That's what it is. There is nothing in a cancer cell that will kill you. There's nothing in a cancer cell that will kill you. It only kills you is if it expands and grows and puts pressure and stops fluid or blood supply or blocks something, right? That's why it kills you. There's nothing in the cell itself that will kill you. So the situation is, if you create a body that's an environment for cancer cells to live in, but not a healthy environment for healthy cells to live in, what, does those, what do those cells have to do to stay alive? They have to shift. They have to morph themselves into cancer cells. That's it, guys. Does that make sense to you? Can you wrap your brain around that? So the cause is the cure. The cause is the environment. If you want to read books about this, buy anything written by Bruce Lipton. Bruce Lipton is a PhD cell biologist. He wrote The Biology of Belief. It's a fascinating, wonderful book to read. He was actually a professor of mine at chiropractic college. He's been a professor at medical schools. Um, he's just a fascinating individual. But he took cells. He took stem cells. We all hear this stuff about stem cells, right? And he put stem cells in different environments. And what he found is, is that depending on what environment you put the stem cell in, depends on what it turns into. Does that make sense? So you can take, so every cell in your body has the same DNA in it, right? You don't have like different DNA in a liver cell compared to your heart cell, but they have totally different functions, don't they? They have completely different functions. So how can a liver cell and a heart cell have completely different functions with the same blueprint inside them? because they're in a different environment which requires them to be a different thing, right? It's this whole conversation of nature or nurture. It's nurture. Nature's perfect, <laughs> right? I mean, seriously. Do trees just ever forget to grow up? Does, it, does an acorn ever forget to turn into an oak tree? Do you plant corn and broccoli comes out? There's laws that govern this universe. Listen, I use this metaphor with people all the time. If we could take a guy and land him on the moon and fly him back and land him in a specific spot, then obviously the laws of physics aren't just random and changing all the time or we wouldn't be able to do that. Right? It's not random. If the laws are that exact, that I can fly a man to the moon and I can land him back in a certain spot in Florida, right? Those are the same laws that govern everything. So the, is the situation is the environment that you put the cells in. If you put the cells in an environment where, they, where healthy cells can't live, they have to stay alive. They want to stay alive. They have to turn themselves into something right? that can stay alive. And then that cell starts to grow and What's that? Cancer. So what's the solution? Exactly what Bruce Lipton did in a Petri dish. Take the cells out of the stressful environment, put them into a nurturing, healthy environment, and guess what they do? Get better. Did he change the DNA when he did that? No. He changed the environment that the cell was in. That's what cancer is. That's what it is. It's your body keeping you alive. Could I say this, that it's a good thing? That cancer is a survival mechanism of your body. It buys you time to fix the problem. I know this is radical <laughs> thinking. Go ahead. Mike, how do you explain then when an athlete gets cancer? Because an athlete is concerned with performance, not health. Right? That, that's my whole thing. People say, you know, if chiropractic health is performance, why don't, why don't you work with more professional athletes? Why don't you? Athletes are concerned with running faster, jumping higher, 
swimming faster, right? That's the goal. The goal isn't how do I express health? Because many of the things they do are absolutely unhealthy. Many of the supplements they take, many of the foods they eat, many of the training programs they're on, they have nothing to do with health. They absolutely improve performance. But the question becomes, what's the goal, health or performance? And they're choosing performance, right? I mean, you know, I mean, we have world-class athletes, right, running around on all kinds of sports fields, getting all kinds of cancer. And he talks about that in this book. He talks about, you know, here we got all these guys on ESPN that Merrill, Merrill Hodge and all these people, right? What kind of massive trauma did Merrill Hodge take to his head? How many concussions did he have? What do you think the nerve supply to the rest of his body is coming out of his spine? Do you think he's getting proper nerve supply to all of his organs all the time, right? So these, these are excellent fundamental questions, and that's what tonight is about, is to, to think through these thoughts. Because we, we look at these people and they got shredded abs and we say health. Patrick Swayze had shredded abs. Farrah Fawcett was beautiful. They weren't healthy, guys. They just weren't healthy. If they were healthy, they'd be here today because he's not old enough to be dead. There's lots of people running around that eat fast food most meals of their life and they're thin. And they walk around in the confusion of saying, I'm thin, therefore I'm healthy. And I'm saying, that is doing the same thing to your vessels as the 300 pound guy. You just